Um, so it's lovely to be here as always. Wendy, that's right, I forgot you read that Salon story I wrote a few years ago. It was a feature article I wrote um, that ended up, was the, the original story that ended up being uh, converted or adapted into uh, a book. But um, it was a kind of an unusual place for that story to end up as well in Salon, which is a political magazine. But thankfully, it turned into a story and uh, it found quite a, quite a good readership, as you mentioned, so I've been quite happy about that. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, and it was funny when you asked, because I know Victor posted this in the Facebook group, what do you do about skeptics? And I always think you don't do anything about them because I was one for most of my life. And the one thing I know about skeptics is there's no point in trying to convince them of anything if, if they don't come to it in their own time, in their own way, they won't. And if they are going to come to it, they'll do it on their own. So I don't really bother um, trying to convince a skeptic of anything. It's just an exercise in futility, really. But my background um, was, uh, as I said, I was a, a political journalist and a war correspondent. And just after I got back from Iraq, I was down um, south doing some research for my first book, which is part of the Northern Ireland peace process, when my fiance suddenly died. Um, I had a sudden massive heart attack back in New York one after Saturday afternoon and out for a bike ride. So the shock of it, I'm sure you can imagine, he was only 41. Um, I stayed in the South and uh, trying to research, trying to keep occupied on this book. And, and then um, what started happening was also it's a very, very weird and strange thing, which are things I write about into death, don't just part, that led one, one step after another to just sort of this epiphany that he had not, his consciousness at least had not died. And then that sent me on, um, which I talk about in the book, that sent me off on a sort of a journey of discovery uh, and reading, speaking, interviewing people to try to understand exactly what it was, what was the nature of the continuity of consciousness. So it's all very heady journalistic sort of stuff. I wouldn't believe anybody, anything to, anyone told me unless I could actually find a source for it. Um, but I actually think and ultimately it sort of stood to me in the end because I ran into and one of the things that I really do advocate now is that we challenge all our beliefs about the afterlife and the nature of the afterlife. What you know, there's what I found and I come up against this all the time in my PhD as well, where an awful lot of our superstitious thoughts are originating from, you know, thoughts that we've been carting around since classical period 2000 years ago um, and that can do quite a lot of harm to people when we start doing you know things like oh somebody's stuck and they won't move on or we're harming people and holding them back I mean I heard an awful lot of that myself uh, on my journey and there's a whole chapter in my book where I talk about having to confront that so it was very important to me when it became quite apparent that it wasn't just my partner who could communicate with me but anybody could that I actually learn and study and do this properly. So I went off to the Arthur Findlay College. I spent quite a lot of time there. It's just outside London and um, did an awful, and had benefited from some really fantastic teachers who were not just great mediums, but also very discerning and um, very knowledgeable and um, spent a lot of time really trying to understand what was going on within a 21st century framework, not a medieval or a classical, framework or a Victorian framework, but but certainly in a contemporary framework because there's so been so many advances in consciousness theory and what the nature of what is going on can be that uh, I kind of feel that it has made me see mediumship as something that is very healing and um, very progressive. And as I was saying to half the people here who were just listening to me up until 10 minutes ago, um, there is such vision and such scope for just so much wonder uh, in mediumship that I think sometimes we can get caught up in some classes and so, you know sometimes where it's all about getting a laundry list of details and evidence and we can often lose sight of the extraordinary. And I think it's uh, it's one thing that I really try to imbue when I'm working with my, my own mediumship and when I'm teaching is to always remember how extraordinary this is. You know, um, I mean, I know 100 years from now we'll be thinking, oh, it's all very ordinary because in a way it is very normal. 
but it is at the same time really just extraordinary that what we can do happens at all you know so i really do try to stress that you know to allow people tell their story and just to approach this work just with wide-eyed wonder it's very easy to get jaded in anything but this is certainly not something we should ever lose sight of how, you know, the, how extraordinary how profound how healing and the mystery of it is fantastic so we really don't have all the answers to how it, what's happening and why it's happening but that's i think part of the journey um i know with um what i try to do with my you know uh, wendy was saying that being a journalist and still doing a lot of this writing i mean my book believe it or not was actually reviewed by forbes magazine which is very unusual considering it's a book about uh, a memoir about a continued relationship through the veil but it still appeared in Forbes and there's another story I wrote appeared in the Irish Times which is a very conservative newspaper so there is um, and I just found out last week it's actually on sale in Target so I thought um, this is sort of interesting because it's very mainstream stuff that's sort of paying attention to the book and I think part of that is because it was written um, by somebody who started as a skeptic and also by a journalist who challenged everything that was told to me. I mean, I never accepted anything that was just told to me. It always had to be, why is this happening? Where is the source for this? What's the proof of this? Um, and I think it's really helped me in my own work, in my own life, but also working with other people um, to really help them heal, to be able to dispense with any kind of carryover beliefs we have from other eras. Um, so I, I do think that it's not just writing about mediumship that has sort of helped make this a little bit more mainstream and, you know, taken, stripped away the superstition from it and started to look at it in a very contemporary way in the context of what we do know about consciousness and sort of even physics to some degree. Um, but also I feel that my writing has helped my mediumship because I naturally try to capture a person's story and I felt I feel like when I was training especially in the early days as a medium I found that uh, there was uh, you know I would I would go into a class and they'd have a flipboard there with a list of facts that I had to sort of shake out of the spirit person for it to be considered a good evidential reading and what I have thankfully found is that um, you know thanks to some very good tutors at the college but also you know my own sort of imperative to always try to get to the truth of a character just in writing is that uh, it is very important to allow a story to unfold and so what I've sort of moved on to I've tried to sort of progress my own mediumship and, and, and the mediumship I teach into that sort of progressive way of actually allowing the person the the person the person in spirit form to speak their story to express their character themselves what they choose to share because they know what they need to say to be known to their loved one so i don't need to give them a shopping list of things they need to share and i found that in working in that way um, the fullness of their presence and their character uh, is felt but but not only that, we also can see that their character continues, you know, because we can feel it. And and often what I find is that, especially for people who've been in the spirit world a while, the messages that they come back with and the explanations that they offer for their behavior, whatnot, for example, when they're here towards the, the, the person in physical form, the complexities of those relationships can come forth that... So it's not just a, I'm sorry for being a lousy father. You know, I mean, it's not that kind of trouble sort of apology. The actual reasons, um, the explanations of what they did or the reasons why they did them it comes from, you can tell, years of self-reflection self in spirit form that you can see that natural growth and evolution within them in the spirit world. And then they can come back and they can offer that uh, by way of healing for themselves and for their loved ones here in physical form in a meaningful way in a way that you can actually come back oh you know what now I actually understand why they did that it's power it can be really powerful stuff I think it's what's important is that we trust the knowledge and the wisdom of those in spirit form and allow them speak 
and just trust that that will happen and just really get out of the way and have the humility to really to be able to give them that space to speak. So is that, does that sort of give you, Wendy, an overview of how I work? I, I think that's wonderful, Karen. That's uh, really so, um, I think, so important. And I think the whole idea of developing your, your own uh, style based on your experience is really wonderful. So I'm going to throw it over to people. I've got some questions if nobody else has a question. Actually, let me start you off. Did you ever have mediumship ability as a child? I'm really interested in this because a lot of our mediums say, oh, yes, I grew up with this and I had no, whereas others discover it in adulthood. Mm. Mm. What about you? What was your situation? Um, I, I had, when I was uh, young, up until maybe I was about 12, um, certainly had experiences of sort of waking up and there being strange persons sort of looking at me in the bedroom that I could only, see, you know, that their feet sort of knees from knees down sort of disappeared into blackness. Um, my mother, when I was very young, my mother uh, told me later, I didn't, rec I didn't remember this, that I would um, sort of be having conversations with people. I'd be at three years old having a conversation with an adult sort of in another room. And she'd be saying, like, who are you talking to? And I would be saying, I'm talking to this man. Um, and I did have some sort of more telekinetic experiences. But I have to say, from the time I, once I hit 13, I, you know, I had gone to Catholic school. And I can't tell you by the time, by 13 to 17, I just thought I'd had my fill of religion. I thought I'd never get out of there, you know. So um, I really don't remember. When I look back now, I kind of, there are times where I remember, I know that, I was struck, even in when I was a devout skeptic, there were times now when I look back where there were certain insights or intuitions I had about people or situations that at the time I didn't think twice about, but obviously were, you know, some kind of clairsentient ability. But uh, they, so there were, there were some um, instances there when I was younger, but I think most children have those and they have those sorts of experiences and probably just don't understand them at the time. You know, I think a lot of adults sort of say, oh, they're just imaginary friends or it's just nonsense and you just sort of dismiss them. My mother didn't believe in this at all, which is really strange since she's like, Catholic. she was devout Catholic and prayed to the saints. They were just deceased individuals, you know, but, um, but she had no time for it at all. And then he, I just kind of grew out of it. I had no interest in it. But I do have friends who have kids who see them and have these conversations. And because the friends, my friends, know this about me, they have been much more understanding about it with their own children. So I think that's been helpful for them not to be dismissed. Um, I do think that most people have those experiences at some point, even if it's just one or two as a child, that maybe they forget about. And I do feel that everybody, to some degree, has this ability, even in adulthood. Thank you. Varying different. Hi. So, yeah, my question um, is for Karen. I, you know, I come across people say, oh, I'm, I'm a born psychic medium. I'm, I never had any training and there are classes and they do, they say they do this work. But my question is to you. I, I mean, I took psychic development classes just to bring up my self-esteem and self-confidence in that. So when you when you hear people say I don't need any classes or training or anything like that, do you do you, do you feel they're as as good as a psychic medium or like I feel like I always need to continue and grow, so I just keep learning, you know, taking classes and doing the must because the universe is so big. So how do you feel about when people say that like I, I don't need I'm a born psychic medium I don't need, I never took any classes or anything like that. I how do you feel about that? Um. Well, first of all, every, I do believe everybody is psychic to some degree. So everybody's born with some degree. Of, I mean, it's our, the na it's our nature. You know, we are telepathically interconnected. We know this. We know this from consciousness theory. We know this from science. We've seen all of those experiments. But that is just part of the nature of being human. So everybody has that ability. Some people are more, it's like playing the piano. I'm terror. I have no musical ability. I would, I would, on a good day, I could get through chopsticks. 
you know. But then there's some people that are fantastic, and it's the same. There's scales of every of ability and everything, you know. Now I don't know. I've never come across a concert pianist who ever said, "I'm a born concert pianist. I don't need to take any classes." And I think that goes across the board for everything. You know, it's even if you have a wonderful ability. That doesn't necessarily mean you know everything there is to know about the nature of consciousness, about the mechanics of how it's going. It doesn't mean that you know everything about the philosophy and the healing and the wisdom of other people. So I am always a proponent of there is so much wisdom there from people who have gone before that it is I it can only benefit us to read and to be informed and to be educated and to understand that even you know, Beethoven probably didn't just roll out of bed into Ode to Joy. You know? Lovely. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Great. Well, yes, thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for being here, by the way, Karen. Um, we all appreciate your your knowledge, your wisdom on these topics. Um, you mentioned um, early on about um, wanting to spell superstitions um, that we've had about the afterlife or whatever. So I'm curious what your understanding of the structure of the environment of the afterlife is and, you know, where you think those superstitions fall into place. Well, that is a massive conversation probably for another day, but I will say in brief, um, you know, we've come up between classical Greco-Roman literature, the idea of Hades, the idea of having to kind of right the wrongs for a soul to rest, um, come from a concept of Hades that we actually in the West don't have. It's not really the same kind of idea as hell in Christian theology. So we can kind of get into um, these sort of bits and pieces of things that have been passed down. So ideas like a soul can't rest unless they have a proper funeral, for example, is classical literature you know that comes from classical literature and you know by and then it's kind of gone on you know we've got hamlet we've got this is what i'm doing my phd on like where these ideas come from we have this whole literary tradition that and that arises out of our culture where is you know if a spirit is murdered or wronged they cannot rest until we avenge them you know these are literary tropes that have been passed down through the years and arise in different ways in different religions um, and the one thing that's happened in the west is that we have kind of absorbed aspects of everything since really the 60s, you know, um, bits and pieces of all sorts of religions, and we've kind of put them into, you know, curated our own particular belief systems around anything. Um, I always say that, you know, um, the, I've, and I have found this in my experience, the people who can do the greatest healing for somebody who has just transitioned to the spirit world is the spirit world itself. You know, so the idea people kept saying to me, oh, you're holding your partner back because you're grieving. And I hear this all the time. It's very common. And it does a colossal amount of harm to people because you've got people who are grieving. They need to be allowed to grieve. You think that their loved one just got on a bus and left them and said adios and go cry your eyes out. I'm off to a better life. But it's just not realistic. You know, it's just really not realistic. And I think when we start looking at very 21st century concepts and the research that's been really moving forward with the likes of, you know, um, Dean Radin and Rupert Sheldrake and a lot of these people I know Wendy's spoken to as well, we start to see that the paradigms that we've held since classical times and old biblical times and even Eastern religions and native religions, you know, were approximations of what people felt they experienced. You know, it's like Jesus spoke in parables simple reason that that's an existence that cannot be explained because it's outside our frame of reference you know and then when we when we start to have to explain things that are out i mean language evolves to reflect what we know so there are no words for what doesn't exist see what i mean and so the only way to describe something that we don't see or experience that we don't have words for is to approximate is to use metaphor and parables and then when people start taking these things literally, literally, that's when things start getting confused. Very good, thank you. Can I ask one more little kind of tail into that? Sure. Um, so I guess, um, I, at least,
least originally it sounded like maybe you were talking about our our concepts of of hell and you know punishment or you know these kind of lower vibrational states it's also been um it's a fairly common idea among mediums that um after you transition out of this life you kind of end up uh where you expect to right and you see who you expect to see if you expect to see christ you see christ if you expect to see your family, you see your family, or Buddha, you see Buddha. Um, how much does what we take with us out of this life impact then what we're going to experience? Well, I think uh, uh, probably quite a lot. I'm not in the spirit world. I don't remember my last trip around there, so I can't speak from that except to extrapolate what I know. But we know that we, we, we create our own reality to a large extent in this world based on our perceptions. So I think in a more fluid world like the afterlife, that effect would be even more powerful. Yes, hi. I was just interested to know whether you were doing your PhD on an area of spirituality. I'm doing it on the cultural influences on contemporary ghost literature. So I'm looking at things like old myths old religions old um literature old stories and how that has evolved into contemporary 21st century literature which is a very very different um there's a very different trend in contemporary literature so all of the old tropes of like ghosts only haunt or ghosts only come back for revenge and all this kind of stuff is doesn't exist in a lot of contemporary literature my argument is that's because culturally we have changed and we've shifted really since the 60s you know, with um, with the arrival of sort of Eastern thought and also with developments in consciousness theory and in science, that now we've got a whole body of literature starting to emerge in the last 20, 20, 20 years where um, the, the supposed ghost, they're calling, as it's called, is actually the narrator and the, and the action is happening in the afterlife and very complex stories are evolving and being explored in terms of, you know, our our contemporary world in the afterlife so these old ideas of kind of horror stories and hauntings and stuff have sort of fallen by the wayside which I find very very progressive and very reassuring. I would imagine it's difficult to find supervisors in that sort of area for PhD level. Well my first supervisor uh, specializes in supernatural literature and my second supervisor is a professor of English literature who seems to know in a remarkable amount of stuff about everything. So, I, the, I, well, I mean, the idea of a PhD is, is that you've got to write, you've got to address something that hasn't been addressed, right? That's the whole point of a PhD. So, you, if you are addressing something that your supervisors are experts in, there's something wrong, you know, you're supposed to be actually bringing some new, some new study and some new information to light, which is what I'm trying to do. But they're quite supportive Thank you. of my idea, which is kind of unusual. They are, thankfully. Some decades ago, my mother was very, very terrified of death. And I read the Brian Weiss books on Many Lives, mm -hmm. Many Masters, and I got her to read those. And it gave her a great deal of peace. And I think she was more comfort, comforted in her uh, passing because of uh, those books. And then more recently, during the pandemic, I've been sitting in on Scott Milligan's classes, and he, trans he, he brings through Eric. Mm -hmm. And Eric says, oh, no, there is no reincarnation. And then on Sunday, it was so wonderful to hear Gary. Uh, it's Mannion, right, isn't it, Wendy? Mannion? That's right. And um, he was asked questions about reincarnation, and he's obviously a, a believer in reincarnation, as Brian Weiss is. And... and the difference in the uh, two trance mediums, uh, Scott Milligan and uh, Gary Mannion, that causes confusion, I think, in the community. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on reincarnation based on well, your... I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't know that you're going to particularly like my answer either. First of all, um, they're having two disparate theories from two trans mediums uh, also speaks to the question somebody asked me earlier about perception. We see, we filter every experience through the lens of our own perceptions in this world, and I would imagine in every world, which is why two people can see the same thing very different ways, you know. So, our perception, we cannot be separated from our perceptions, 
and our influences on those perceptions. It's just not, it, there's no such thing as objective truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth either. I mean, if we try to claim that, there's a bit of a problem there. You know, there's always subjective truth and everything is always colored by perception. Um, I have often asked that question. Um, how, if there is reincarnation, how can mediumship exist at all? You know, if, for example, my mother, who is, I mean, the bardo, a lot of people now, because of Eastern influences, hold that the bardo, which is only 49 days, um, if my mother is passed, how can I still communicate with her? How can I still communicate with my great grandmother in the spirit world if there's reincarnation? Surely she'd be back around the planet by now, taking another trip around the sun, you know. So there is a fundamental conflict between concepts of reincarnation and mediumship or spiritualism. Because how can you be communicating with somebody who's reincarnated, you know? So this is an ongoing issue. It, part of that comes from two fundamentally different belief systems kind of coming to, trying to come together. We've got a reincarnation is, is an Eastern belief system originally coming together with you know, spiritualism, which kind of came out of the West and was heavily influenced by Christians in one form or another. And so we've got these two conflicting theologies or ideologies that just don't mix, you know, and people constantly always trying to put them together, but they don't go together. So you can see the conflict, you know. So what I understand about it is um, that I actually believe we are much more complex. And this again comes from me being a complete consciousness nerd, a uh, consciousness theory nerd, is that um, in science, the, and this actually has been around for a while, is that there's the idea that um, the whole is in the part. Now, I don't want to go off boring everybody, but in physics now, there is a theory that every, every single particle contains within it the entire universe. As hard as it is mind-bending as that is to get your head around. Um, and that the same goes for consciousness. All consciousness exists in every drop of consciousness, you know. And what happens for us is that we exist now because we are a piece of that consciousness that has turned its awareness to Karen now and has become Karen, you know. What that means is it's almost like, you know, it becomes a, a sort of a question of, um, you know, a wave arises from the ocean returns to the ocean and arises again. And then the question becomes, is it the same wave? How much of that consciousness continues as the same consciousness, you know? So I actually feel that we are very literal in our understanding of, we think, well, there's physical form and there's spirit form and there's separate things. I don't believe the separate things at all. And I do feel that, um, we are all just coming into being and going, we're we coming and going out of this universal consciousness all the time, you know? And so the only thing that would make sense to me is from my experience is that we would have to have be multidimensional. So we would have to be able to exist in physical and spirit form all the time. Because that would, the only way, and I think that we are probably that complex. You know, I think the idea of we are born into a body, we die out of the body, we go into spirit form. I think it's, I think it's, it's going, I think what we'll find over the next whatever amount of hundred century is that that's too complex, the concept for, for human existence. And that we are in, existing in, in different dimensions simultaneously, which is why, you know, and I don't believe everybody reincarnates either. It really does seem to me that if people do, I mean, clearly the work of Ian Stevenson, it's very hard to refute that is not accurate. That's so well researched. But it does seem that some people choose it and some people don't. But I also think even for those who don't, or even for, regardless whether you do or you don't, I do feel we are actually existing in multidimensional space. But we are so used to linear thinking and to three dimensions and to time, it's very hard for us to wrap our head around the idea of existing in multi-dimensions. I don't want to sound too new agey or too far out about that, but it is kind of the simplest way I can explain the hard problem of consciousness, you know. Hi, Karen. Lovely to see you. Hi. You too. Um, yes, I did uh, go to the Arthur Finley College about 17 years ago, and I was uh, in the course with uh, 
uh, that uh, Glenn Edwards was uh, running mm. at the time. Fantastic medium. Mm. Um, I found that um, going there, it was different for me because I actually had a gentleman who came to me after an operation and um, he said, you'll be well, you'll be fine and I'll come with you to the Arthur Finley College and that um, trance will be your thing. Mm. And that gentleman who tells me that his last incarnation, he was a Victorian and he even gave me the name of the street uh, in Mayfair, London, where he used to live. So mm. needless to say, with Google Maps these days, I checked that and sure enough, the street was there. Mm. But he has been such a kind gentleman and he talks to me every day for 17 mm. years. The moment I wake up and the last thing at night before I go to bed, he likes to summarise my day. But I feel as though, um, well, the question I would say is, I don't know how normal that is in terms of trance work because he adapts to what I, I want of myself. So now that we've got um, Skype in operation for quite a while, he loves coming on. And if there's someone that I don't know that we decide to meet up or people even that I do know, he'll entrance me and he will talk to them directly on Skype. And he gives them insights into relatives that are in the spirit world. And he talks about, I've been talking to your relative, whoever it is, and they have a message for you. So I'm that sort of piggy, piggy in the middle there that's, um, you know, going through the process, but he's providing the information. Mm -hmm. So he is inspirational. But what do you make of that scenario for me where his, shall we say, um, involvement with me is ongoing on a daily basis and is like the other half of me. Because my question in my own mind is, how does that relate to higher self and the potential amalgamation with maybe that individual? Well, the first thing I would ask you is, is do you have a problem with it? Absolutely not, I cherish it. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? There isn't a problem. I'm merely relaying my situation and wondering in terms of uh, unfolding even further with the trance work, mm -hmm. is there some aspect that I may be overlooking that I should be asking for his assistance or guidance? Well, um, the one thing I would think about it is, is that um, it takes a lot of energy to do that. So, and you kind of really do need to just give him permission or to set boundaries. Like if you're all day dealing with this would be my only concern that there should be a time and a place for the work so that, you know, you're not exhausting or tiring yourself out. And maybe you're not, it doesn't matter. I haven't heard of this. I mean, I've, 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 I've never heard of somebody where their person is, just, I think, no, actually I say that and there was a teacher that came that her 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 control i think they call it's your control we're talking about uh will just kind of come through willy-nilly whenever he felt like it if that's okay with you that's okay with you but um but normally there would be an agreement this is when we work and this is when i'm off doing my shopping do you know what i mean and it's as easy as that um are you you're working with trans speaking or trans communicating or both you're working with both it sounds like well it's he's I, I would say just it's a telepathic communication on a personal level each day. Mm. But as far as Skype and so on, that might be once a, once a week or fortnightly, whatever it happens to be. I mean, but I would say if, if you're able to sit with him by yourself and you've got enough power yourself to be able to have these communications happen, mm. what I would suggest perhaps you could experiment with is actually trans writing or automatic writing. Because if he is, if your if your um, connection to him is so strong that you can actually have this a very you know fluid amount of information flowing without needing, like Scott Milligan for instance, he does he's not he does automatic mediumship. So so but he'll sit in a room with twenty people to have the power to do that kind of work. But if you're able to do that kind of work by yourself, without needing the power of a whole bunch of other people, um, I would suggest perhaps. 
trying with trans writing so that you can set aside the amount of time for the two of you to sit together. And if he's got something to say or some wisdom to share, then he starts sharing with you and you can start writing it down. You know, instead of just kind of wandering around Tesco's with him chatting in your ear, what, what not, you know what I mean? He's obviously got something to say, so it may very well be that you just need to give him a format to say it in. I don't know if that answers your question or if that even addresses your question. It does. No, that's very helpful. Uh, and I will just say in conclusion, not to hold up the process, but um, he holds back on a number of things that he says are related to the past. And he mm. does intimate to me that there was a past life relationship, but he doesn't mm. want to go into any of the detail because he said that that would cloud the issue. Yeah. Well, I mean, personally, I, I'm not really a big one. I, you know, I practice them for 15 years. I'm not really a big advocate of digging around in the past it's like whatever is there in the past that needs to heal is in the present to be healed we don't need to necessarily go digging around in the past i wouldn't care, couldn't care less to be honest if how i it just depends on the person some people just love to know i i kind of feel if the person is present with you now it's for work that needs to be done in the present and that should be the focus yeah. you know yeah. um obviously there is a close relationship there but obviously it sounds like both your paths and, and both your soul's growth are connected and it's a matter now of being able to actually manifest what needs to be manifested. I mean, he's not just hanging around to have cups of tea and watch the telly with you. Do you know what I mean? Like he's obviously with you because yeah. something can be shared. So I would, I would, since you don't need an audience, I would try writing. See if you can actually put something down, um, yeah. if you can create something together. Thank you, Karen. That's brilliant. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I have an issue. Sometimes I'm very emotional and I'm very sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. I had a client last week. And when I say client, um, I'm a hairstylist. This is a client that's in my chair I'm working with. And her mother shows up, her deceased mm -hmm. mother, which has happened before. I knew her mother. And her mother had some... Um, psychic mediumship ability I'm really not sure so I think there's just an easy connection between me and her but mm -hmm. she gave me information to give to my client her daughter about her son's upcoming wedding and I'm telling her and I'm bawling my eyes out and she's crying and it's beautiful and I'm she's wanting her to give the earrings that she got from her to the daughter, to the new daughter-in-law to wear on her wedding day. And she's like, I know exactly which earrings those are. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. It's so, how do I take my emotions out of that? I mean, cause I was like, it was, it was beautiful, but I don't want to be crying while I'm getting these messages. You, you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I think it's, well, two things. First off, if you, if this is somebody you know, and she knows that this happens and she's open yes. to it, that's fine. Like, so the one thing I'll just, I'll just say this, and I know this is not relevant to your specific situation, is that I've come across lots of mediums who go around giving total strangers messages from loved ones. No. I'm just going to say that, say that in the room that we don't want to be doing that because that could actually generate a lot of harm. We weren't given permission to make that con contact. So we don't, it's like, um, we don't go sticky, you know, acu like acupuncturists go, don't go sticking needles in people who are just standing at bus stops, you know what I mean? So we only really want to be able to offer that when there is permission to do that. So, but in your case, since you knew this person and since this is an understanding that the two of you have, um, I really, in that scenario, I really don't see what's so wrong with being, it's your friend and it's the mother, what's so wrong with being so emotional? Now, I mean, if you've got a paying client sitting in front of you that you don't know, you don't want to be <laughs> blubbering. Right? No, I would never do um, it unsolicited, that's, no, never, but. But I mean, if you're working with, if you're actually working, so if it's a standard sort of sitting and somebody comes um, that you don't know and says, you know, they give you whatever, 50 bucks or whatever, and they say, I'd like to book a session with you. Uh, in that, you need to have a certain degree of professionalism. You don't want to be blubbering all over them. But then you probably wouldn't blubber all over them because you wouldn't have the same emotional connection both to the mother and to the friend. Do you know what I mean? So if it started coming up in that scenario, I'd say, okay, you need to just do a lot of practice, a lot of training, and just to be able to have a little bit of self-mastery. But, you know, since you're already, it is an emotional situation. This is your friend and your friend's mother and your old friends, and you are emotionally invested in this. Scenario. I, I kind of in that that scenario don't think there's anything 
wrong with getting sort of i mean it's a wedding yeah. <laughs> everyone gets emotional right so, and i was so excited yeah, I, I got the information correct and she knew exactly what earrings i was talking about but i um, mean probably you were just crying with relief i would say probably there's an aspect of that in it as well you know what i mean but, but come on it's a wedding do you know what i mean wedding baby stuff like that if it's your friend you know they're probably delighted you're all emotional with them if everyone's crying there but but, uh, but for as long as it's you're not bringing it and do and behaving like that in front of complete strangers. <laughs> no, I, I don't do readings for for money, you know, professionally. Mm. But I, if I ever did, I I could see how the difference would be. I would not be emotionally connected with them like I am this friend. So okay, mm. that helps me. Thank you. Mm. Um, yeah, actually, I just wanted to comment on what Philip was talking about. Um, and maybe Karen will have something to add, but um, I think um, a lot of that has to do with how empathic you are as well. Um, and whether or not that's coming from the person sitting in front of you or the person that you're connecting to, um, I very often feel the emotion, you know, very early on in readings. Um, one of the most memorable ones I had was um, when I had a family come to me actually with their young sons, I mean, but it was the parents that brought them and it was really this about 10, 11 year old boy that was primarily there for the, the reading. And I instantly had such an overwhelming sense of love for this boy that I knew it was not mine. I had not ever met him before. Um, but it was just, it was, it was almost overwhelming. Um, and of course it turned out that it was his uh, grandmother who was his primary caretaker who passed away um, because both of his parents worked and he was with her every day, all day for, you know, pretty much his entire life. Um, so I'm just, I'm wondering if the tears were not really even necessarily your own. Does that make sense? If the tears were your friends, if the tears were the mother's, and you just empathically felt all of that. Does that make sense? Um, and Karen, all of you have anything to add to that? Well, first off, all communications are emotional because we have to be clairsentient for the communication to happen. So we are always should feel the emotion of the person if we're not feeling the emotion, um, particularly the person of the person in the spirit world then we're really not bringing their presence to bear on the situation because we have to be able to feel that, feel that close sentency um, to make their presence known. Otherwise, it's just going to feel very, very flat and it's just going to be like the laundry list of facts I was saying earlier. Um, I, without being present, I can't talk about the specifics of what exactly happened with Philip, but what I will say is having done hundreds, thousands of sittings, um, Generally, the emotion will come from blending with the person in the spirit world because you're inviting them to come blend with you. You know, now if you're working psychically with the person in front of you and it's a psychic reading about them, you will pick up um, things going on with them. You'll pick up any kind of fear, love, hope, confusion, anything going on with them, as well as the nature of the work. You know, um, I think what we're talking about here is that has to exist in all sessions, discarnate or incarnate. What we're talking about Philip here is Philip getting very excited and overwhelmed and teary-eyed with his friend, which is a different scenario altogether. Can I just say, actually, sorry, I hope I answered your question. Um, Sally, yeah, I'm just looking at the chat and you're, yes, it is, you're right. The, it is reincarnation, the concept does exist in the Bible. It is not commonly known. That's why I say it became part of our cultural awareness largely through the countercultural uh, movements in the 60s that kind of brought the Eastern philosophy to the West because reincarnation was censored from the Bible. So un unless you're really devoted and some kind of biblical scholar, amateur or professional, otherwise most people don't know that. Um, so uh, that's why I say the influence largely came from the East on concepts of reincarnation. So Karen, just a quick one from me. Um, what do you think about spirit rescue circles? Um, oh my goodness, I always get into trouble with these because some people love their spirit rescue circles and I am not a proponent of them at all. Even my our publisher um, and I have gotten into these 
have disagreed on the rest of these circles. My feeling is, is that, um, um, the, first of all, what has never made sense to me is that I've sat with many people who are actually in the process of the transition, of transitioning, and there was always a gathering. Um, there was, I've always been aware of loved ones from the other side come to be with them at that moment of transition. I've been woken up, uh, which is in my book, as you know, by my grandmother who came to collect my aunt, and the two of them woke me up on the way out. Um, so it has never made sense to me. We know there's a gathering. Why there would be a gathering of generations of loved ones, and then they just what? They go what? They forget. They go back to the spirit world and they forget about their loved one here. Like I don't understand. It's completely inconsistent with my experience that somebody could not be aware of um, the fact that they're not dead, or they cannot be aware of the fact that you know their loved ones came and they they stayed behind. It also speaks to these old notions of there being geography involved. You know, that they're here and they're supposed to go someplace else. Well, we know there's no geography. It's just a vibrational. We're all just existing on vibrations, physical or non-physical. So I have to say, and I know lots of people hate me for saying this, is that I don't think there's a purpose. I think it is a beautiful thing to pray for our loved ones, to send out love to our loved ones who have passed over, to continue to express our love, continue to share our thoughts, to continue to include them in our lives and vice versa. is a beautiful and very, very positive thing to do. And I do encourage that. But thinking our loved ones are lost, that 10 members of the family came to collect them and then they lost them on the way back to the spirit world to me just has never made any sense. Agree. Okay, so Karen, in your experience, uh, how are you able to distinguish between the feeling of blending with um, a deceased loved one and what you're picking up psychically from the person in front of you in this world, you know, from their memories? Is there like a yeah. difference in the quality of yeah. the feeling? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I know the difference from hours upon hours upon hours of being tortured with exercises to be able to determine that um, over yeah. the years. The feeling, psychic information is not as, it feels different from spirit information. So I've actually had to, for many, many hours, sit in my training in the early days with the name of a living person and an incarnate and a discarnate person without being told who's who. And then mm -hmm. had to work with both of them. What I found is, is an extraordinary information will come up for both of them um, that is accurate, whether they're alive or dead. But after a little while, after a few minutes, you can start to feel there is a difference in the way the energy feels with the person who is in spirit form. It becomes more fluid and it becomes more emotional. So the psychic information generally tends to be a bit more factual. And then you can actually start to feel the emotion of the person in the spirit world. It's very, very subtle. Um, thankfully, I had some tutors in the early days who we're very mindful of this and we had to do a huge amount of work to be able to identify the subtle difference. Um, I think it's a very, very important aspect of training that's often overlooked. And as a result, a lot of people will give messages without realizing some of that information is just from the aura of the living rather than the spirit. But it takes, it takes an awful lot of training to be able to recognize the difference. While we've got you here, would you like to tell people about what other groups you're running? and uh anything yeah we that actually get in touch with you we actually have our uh monthly um group this saturday don't we at 10 30. that's right the, now you're you're doing a a, a free group for free uh, a healing healing trans healing Tra healing anybody We're doing trans healing join, joining that i'll just put up the link for where people can register for that and all the details one uh but you have you have other other groups as well. I'm just I do. I have. Um, we're doing. Um, well, actually, I'm doing automatic and trans writing at the moment. We've already that's already started, but we will be doing that around again. I'm actually for anybody who's in the UK or a UK friendly time zone. I'm doing a course with the Arthur Conan Doyle Center um, that starts on the 21st of June called Mindfulness to Mysticism, which I'm really excited about. It's a new course that I designed especially for them. And it's six weeks, and we're going to be looking at mystics and working with mindfulness and psychism 
with a view towards working in more mystical states. So I'm really excited about that. So that's 21st, but because it's in the UK, it's like 7 p.m. British time, so it's 2 p.m. Um, Eastern, if anybody can come to that. Um, tomorrow, I'm starting a really cute four-week class on, on um, animal communication for psychics and mediums. We're just going to be working with animals and pets, mediumistically and psychically. And I think there's about two places left in that, if anybody was interested in that, um, you can let me know. And then um, I have got some other, I've got a talk actually on the July 1st, which is on this idea of the gathering and no one dying alone, which is pre. And uh, and then the last course I'm doing before I take to um, August off is um, the Psychic Detective, which is a course I'm working. I used to work with the FBI, with feds, to um, try to help them solve crime and find missing people and criminals and stuff. And that starts on the 26th of June, and that's four weeks. So those are what's coming up. And then I'm off for July, and then I haven't posted that full schedule yet. Uh, but actually, uh, you can find all that information. That was a bit of a mouthful. Of my, um, on your on your webpage, is that right? KarenFrancisMedium.com. Yeah. That's Francis with an E. Francis. F-R-A-N-C-E. -E yeah. Francis Medium. Medium. That, that's up there now. So yeah. thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Karen. Anything else you'd like to add? Sorry, I cut you off there. No, I'm just, you know, if anyone wants to come to our healing on Saturday, it's a really lovely group. Um, we're going to be doing some trans healing and it's only about an hour, but it's a, it's a beautiful group and it's to receive okay. healing and to share healing. So please, if anyone's free to come along to. And that's group. Saturday at 10.30 a.m. New York East, time. Eastern. Eastern time. Yeah. 10.30 uh, Eastern time. So that's that's still very. Uh, I think that's. I'm just trying to work out. Remember what time that is, Australian time. That's a little bit earlier than that. Fairly early, anyway. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, Karen. Uh, and we will thank be you, Wendy. Touch. Now you can you can always find out any information about these groups on victorzamet.com Zoom. I'll just write that up there. All our Zoom. Uh, victorzamet.com Zoom. You can find, and you'll find the recording of this meeting will be on that page as well. Karen, I'll, I'll send you uh, the link to the recording and you can okay. uh, access Oh, it. and just one other thing too is if anybody's interested on my website, I do have recorded, and I think somebody just put that in the chat as well, recordings of different meditations that are free, sitting in the power, healing, um, working, balancing, all these sorts of things that are there. And we've heard, had very, very good feedback about those. So please check out oh, good. Uh, Karen's uh, webpage. And actually, I'll put something in the Friday report this week about those so we can draw some attention to them. And mm. Karen, thank you so much. You do so much for so many and you're in, working in so many different areas of mediumship and you're taking it out to an audience that really needs it. Um, getting it out to, to um, different audiences rather than the people who are already committed to it. So I think yeah. you're, you're awakening hearts and minds. 